So first, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, who put this on. It's uh, a great opportunity to talk to other people about fish. I think my uh, my family's heard enough. So um, yeah, uh, I'm going to be talking um, a little bit about some alewife, uh, older alewife, the adult. I'll be wrapping up the alewife trilogy here. Um, most importantly, looking at their uh, migratory behavior as they move from uh, adulthood um, up into the into the uh, coastal estuaries to spawn using high resolution acoustics. So I think the two talks before me did a great job of kind of uh, giving some introduction into river herring, so I won't belabor uh, some of these points, but as we know, river herring are an anadromous species. They spend most of their adult life out in the ocean foraging. Um, in the springtime, they make a spring spawning run into coastal freshwater uh, systems and um, where, they, where they spawn. Now, historically, these are really important species, uh, commercially and recreationally, but what we've seen is basically a century of decline to the point where we're now at kind of near or at historic lows. Um, we've shut down the commercial fisheries. Um, they're considered a species of concern uh, with NOAA and, and NIMS, and there's been two petitions to have them listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act uh, in the past decade, um, both of which, you know, um, that listing was, was not warranted. But regardless, the species, you know, do have some issues moving forward. To make matters worse, uh, these are uh, a data-limited species. If we look at the stock assessments for, the, for, for these, um, what we see is that they are manage and stock complexes kind of associated with kind of regional river systems. But a large chunk of these stock complexes, we don't even have enough data um, to look at long-term trends. Since we shut down a lot of the commercial fisheries, that limits the fisheries dependent data, which a lot of these stock assessments use uh, to look at populations. So we need to come up with new ways to um, give fisheries managers the data that they need to do their jobs. And, one of the main data sources going into the stock assessment is this concept of run size estimate. For people who aren't aware, um, that data is trying to get a count of how many river herring are moving up into rivers uh, to spawn. The idea that you know the, how many fish enter a river is a, a proxy for, for the population size. And this is one of the major data sources going into the stock assessment, especially in New England. How you get the run size estimate, um, there's kind of a patchwork of different monitoring technologies you can use. For example, you know, I'm most familiar here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries contributes four long-term data sets to the stock assessment, two of which they use electronic counters where the fish swim through a little tube and they're counted um, on their way up the river. Um, then there's visual counts where somebody stands next to a river and they count how many herring they see. Now, river, uh, sorry, visual counts are a great tool. Um, and what we've seen is there's been a rapid expansion of these uh, counts um, throughout New England. Uh, there's an example on the right, a whole bunch of different volunteer opportunities where you can come and help uh, to count river herring. And I think these are an awesome opportunity for you know local citizens to interact with this species. I think it's a great um, you know source of kind of community engagement. Um, however, there are some issues with ensuring standardization among these different uh, counts, um, as well as the accuracy of the data that they produce. For example, if we look at some data from the uh, Massachusetts, of, uh, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, this is the Herring River in Harwich, Massachusetts. There's been a, a relatively long-term uh, visual count survey that's been going on in that river, but over the last couple of years, uh, the division has put a, an electronic counter into that system. And what we can see is the data from 2017 that those two, um, those two surveys kind of give you a very different picture of what might be going on in that river system. So we really have to look at uh, what might be going on here. And that's really what we're focusing on, uh, um, on on this project. Now, I think the question that we were looking at is what what's going on with these visual counts? Because they seem really low. Um, I think we have to look at the assumptions of the different survey here. So when you look at visual counts, visual counts assume only daytime movement. Now, there's a recommended sampling design, which was, uh, was a great document by Gary Nelson, 
uh, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, which recommends a stratified random sampling design where you have three time strata between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., and you take replicates in one of each of those uh, three time strata. Now, this was designed based on the historical assumptions of river herring behavior. There's several studies which have shown that uh, river herring primarily migrate during the day. Um, if you look at, uh, this is a species summary um, of alewife, and it says that adult alewife move into freshwater only during daylight hours, primarily between 1,500 and 1,800 hours. This is belt surmise so that light acts as a switch, initiating migration in the morning and halting it in the evening. And while that may be the historical wisdom of the species, there's been several studies which have come out over the past decade which seem to give an alternate view of uh, what might be going on. And a lot of these are using some newer uh, technology that's, that's become available. For example, this is um, a paper by McGowan et al. This was also on the Herring River in Harwich. Um, but the figure on the left here shows the count data that they have over the course of 24 hours. And this is a limited study. They only had about two days worth of data. But they showed that about 70% of the upstream activity actually happened at night. Um, Grote et al. used uh, the same system, this is a, a Didson um, acoustic system, uh, but on the Penobscot River up in Maine, they had about 50% of the passage appeared to occur at night. And then Ogburn et al., uh, a couple years ago, down off the Chesapeake, uh, produced these figures in the, the bottom left here, showing that both alewife and blueback seem to move around the clock with uh, peaks in the afternoon, um, but also carrying on into the evening hours. So one of the things that we were really interested in is trying to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, and the way that we were going to do this is using what's called an acoustic camera. Um, this is a sonar system, so if anyone's been on a you know fishing boat or whatever, uh, you're probably familiar with like a, a fish finder or a depth sounder. The way that they work is you have a transducer. The transducer emits a ping or a chirp. Um, that sound emanates through the water column, bounces off something, comes back. And the time at large depends on, will give you an in, uh, some kind of a clue as to how far away whatever object is um, that, you're, that you're looking for. A traditional depth sounder on a boat will have a single transducer. This system um, actually has 128 individual transducers packed within it. It's, actually, it's also got a um, kind of this proprietary lens system which shapes each one of these beams into a really narrow sliver. So it's only monitoring uh, a thin slice of water, as you can see on the bottom right hand corner here. But what happens is when you have all these transducers offset in a fan-like pattern, when you stitch them all back together, you get these images like this, which are created um, purely from sound. Um, the, I hope you guys can see these videos. Um, but the advantage here is that we can non-invasively study fish, uh, which is important for uh, when you're we're dealing with sensitive species, um, especially trying to uh, get permits to harass large numbers of them. Uh, but we can also observe fish at night and in turbid water. Um, so we can start to address when exactly we are we're seeing these fish. Um, we do have to remember that, you know, we're placing these in systems, uh, but this is a single point in their migration. So when we look at their behavior, we have to remember that this is, again, one point in a, in a larger journey that these fish are, are taking. Um, and the systems do have a limited range, so we have to be uh, a little bit careful. Thank you. Uh, of where we can, we, we can put them. So, we wanted to work within the same system um, as some previous studies were uh, had done some work. So we're looking at the Herring River in Harwich, Massachusetts. Um, Harwich is located uh, midway out the Cape. Um, I don't know if you can see the cursor here, but the fish come up out of Nantucket Sound. They swim through this kind of coastal marsh system. So they hit a fish ladder at the Southern Star uh, that you see on the figure here. Um, they climb the fresh. They climb the fish ladder where they enter fresh water. That's the, the head of the tide right there. Um, this is where we did our deployment right next to where Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries has an electronic counter. Fish can then enter uh, West Reservoir and uh, they can then continue up their journey. 
in the Hinkley Pond and Long Pond, which is their um, spawning habitat. We set the system out in the middle of the in the middle of the alewife run. We let it run for about 500 consecutive hours, and we were able to document about 370,000 herring passing through the system. So this is uh, what the study site looks like. Um, up in the top left, you see this is looking downstream into that coastal marsh. The fish swim up the river, um, enter a fish ladder along the bank, kind of swim up the river uh, in these center figures. Um, this uh, center right figure is the top of the fish ladder. Traditionally, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries has an electronic counter at the top of the ladder. Um, I took these pictures about a week before they put it in early before the, the run started. Fish travel through this kind of corridor um, just above the fish ladder. Then they will exit that corridor into West Reservoir. Oops, sorry. We put our uh, Eris sonar right at the entrance of West Reservoir, which serves as kind of a gate so we can just watch them swim in or, or swim through the system. Uh, what we noticed is that once they went into West Reservoir, they, they never came back. So it, it was a good um, place to put, put the system. What we saw when we look at daily count numbers is that uh, the, the run started out pretty quiet early on, but peaked at around 45,000 fish per day for dropping a little bit and then peaking a second time at about 35,000 fish. Um, trailed off a little bit. Run kept going, uh, but we had our equipment pulled out at that point. When we look at some of the generalized trends, what we can see when we look at herring observations compared to the time of day, um, the dark bars on this um, figure here represent nighttime. These medium kind of gray bars or light gray bars are kind of crepuscular periods either between uh, first light and sunrise or sunset and, and last light. And one thing that you notice is there seems to be kind of a baseline level of activity both night and day that these fish will travel. So they do travel around the clock. However, we do see significant peaks both before sunrise and just before sunset. When we look at it in terms of when they come with the tide, we see that uh, very low numbers during the low tide uh, the highest peak tends to be on an incoming tide, remains kind of high through the, the high tide, and then drops back off um, as the, the tide subsides. Now, we wanted to try to see if we could generalize these trends and see which one of these is maybe a, a, the most significant predictor um, in terms of when we observe herring. So we used generalized additive models where we looked at the herring count as a function of either the day of the year, which is DOI, um, and these, this um, equation here, or time of day, or the, the tidal state. And we ran a whole suite of different models here. Um, the, the best model in terms of AIC was one where Five minutes. the time of day and the tide. So it looks like both of these were important predictors when we're trying to understand when the fish were, were, were arriving. And you can see the smoothing splines that kind of represented a generalized form of, of the data that I have previously shown. But what's interesting is these are additive models. So what it means, if we look at this figure on the bottom right, is that when you look at the time of day on one axis and the tide on another axis, when these two are in phase with one another, i.e. when you have a incoming tide or a high tide around sunrise and sunset, we should have an additive effect of having a large amount of fish present during this period of time. Now, this doesn't happen every day. You don't have the tide and the time of day are not synchronized. They're, they're asynchronous. So we wanted to look at how does this play out over the course of the run. So we use something called wavelet analysis. Now, the top graph here just shows our herring count numbers. These are hourly counts. On the bottom here, this is what we call um, a wavelet analysis. And what you'll see is there's a series of periods um, on the left-hand axis, ranging from a two-hour period to a 128-hour period. Um, as you look across the, the, uh, the run, which the dates are on the bottom, you'll see these hot spots. Where you see the hot spots, that's when you have a strong correspondence between the trends that we see in the data and that corresponding period. We can then collapse uh, the, or aggregate you know, the, the whole run into a global wave spectrum. And what we see is that we have peaks of activity about every 12 hours and a smaller peak of activity about every 24 hours. And while that's interesting in and of itself, um, what's more interesting is if you look at the trends in the data. So 
initially, early on in the data, there's, there's not that much going on. There's not much going on in the run. As the run picks up, we see a strong correspondence with a 12-hour periodicity. And if we look at the data, what we see is that we have peaks of activity around dawn and dusk, like we had previously showed, but these also correspond with the tide. So that we have high tide or incoming tide, which corresponds with dawn and dusk. So these two um, cycles are in phase with one another. As the tide advances in relation to uh, the time of day, we actually see a behavioral shift where now we have high tides in the middle of the day and in the middle of the night, and the fish seem to show peaks of activity in the middle of the night and not in the middle of the day. They seem to be largely absent during the day. As we continue to advance uh, the tide, we see them return back to this um, uh, dawn and dusk behavior when the tides um, go back to a high tide around dawn and dusk. So it seems that both the time of day and the tide are significant predictors. Um, what Two minutes. Okay. Um, just kind of wrapping this up, we also see changes in uh, the behavior. Um, during the day, we tend to see large schools, about 100 individuals, um, whereas at night we see very small schools of only you know, 10 individuals at a time. However, we have about the same passage rate. So what that means is that during the day you have these large schools come through, but they come through intermittently, only every 10 to 15 minutes. Where at night you have small schools, but it's basically a steady trickle going through here. Um, and you know, just for example, this is what it looks like during the day. It's a very large school, um, one of the largest that we had go through, well over 200 individuals. Whereas at night, um, you know, it trickles through. But again, this would be like this for six hours or eight hours or, or whatnot. So when we're looking at monitoring. Um, you know, we have to understand that daytime you have a very heterogene heterogeneous uh, behavioral pattern, whereas at night it's more homogeneous. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but we did the same thing at Mattapoisett. We didn't have very many fish, but we seem to see kind of similar trends in terms of time of day and the tide. Um, this is the wavelet analysis, again, showing when we saw the fish is when these two uh, behaviors were largely in sync with one another. Um, and then when the, the run died off is when um, they fell out of sync with one another. Um, and then we saw the same behavior. So I'll just wrap up by saying uh, when we're looking at when we see river herring, both the time of day and tide and their relation to one another are really important predictors. We're seeing different movement strategies during the day and at night. And if we assume that we uh, were only doing daytime counts, we're going to significantly underestimate run counts. Um, however, that's going to vary depending on the day. We had some days where it was almost all daytime passage. We had other days where it was almost all nighttime passage. On average, we had between 50 and 60 percent of the fish pass that day, which means 40 to 50 percent passing at night. Um, so I will end it there, um, but I will give a shout to Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries for all their help, especially uh, Brad, Sarah, and John. Um, without them, um, especially the insight that Brad had. Um, kind of thought a lot of this was going on and, and kind of highlighted. Um, 